Alright, hey everyone, so we're doing chapter 4 today, uh, Atoms and Elements. Before we get started, I just want to make a couple of announcements. So I'm catching up on Master and Chemistry grades. Check those, make sure those correspond to what you think you got. Um, I did award some points for if a problem, like everybody missed the same problem, then I assume that's something that I did wrong. Uh, so I'll include those questions on the review, which I'm going to start next week. It'll be under content. Uh, there's a review section and I'll start uploading videos for each chapter when I go through Master and Chemistry. Whichever problems gave everybody the most trouble, I will work those and kind of post more videos there for you to get better and get ready for the midterm. Uh, secondly, I want to say, so if you have any more questions about uh, previous chapters, you can email me those and I'll include those in the review as well. Um, I want to apologize for last week's video, if uh, you know the older videos or whatever. If there was something that uh, was confusing about it or whatever, I apologize. So I'm taking care of my grandmother now, kind of primary caretaker. Uh, she had COVID and then recovered, but she's still a little unwell. So she's living with us. It's kind of taken away. It, it, causes a lot of distraction or whatever it makes it hard for me to do these videos sometimes I've switched to the headset mic so you'll hear me breathe a lot more uh, but hopefully it'll decrease the background noise that you're picking up so um, that being said everything's good uh, I've got my iPad back working um, and these next couple chapters are short and more or less uh, just concept based not a lot of math so yeah, not a, not a lot of math that I can think of. Maybe a little bit, but not much. Not like this last chapter was. So uh, for those of y'all can kind of breathe easy, the people that hated math that much. And let's get into Chapter 4, Atoms and Elements. So I'm going to post the PowerPoints, uh, or have posted, will post these PowerPoints. Um, make sure when you go through them that you do it in present mode uh, because it allows you to look at individual questions like the study checks here if you go through the present mode they don't all pop up at one time each time you click the next one pops up so you can kinda test yourself on these different uh, study checks right let me go to the text first uh, and let's get into atoms and elements alright so an atom uh, one thing I want to talk about before I really get into it is uh, the wording that we that we use in chemistry is usually very particular okay so everybody's heard of atoms right the smallest individual components that anything can be broken down into most people have heard of elements right elements are any what any one of them atoms could be there's only 118 elements that we think exist in the entire universe uh, and most of them we know and use readily uh, nitrogen oxygen I shouldn't say most of them but a lot of them that we use the most we were already familiar with hydrogen oxygen nitrogen uh, phosphorus right these these kind of things that you've heard before uh, now let's kind of pin down what they mean for chemists because we use them more specifically uh, to refer to different things so let me bring up the iPad real quick all right, so everybody's heard H2O, right? Water is H2O. What is well, H2O? What does that mean? All right, so this is how it's written. H is hydrogen. Okay. The O is oxygen. And the two. This is the N. Uh, the two means that there are two hydrogen. So this is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Now, if I were thinking about this, these here, the letters are the chemical symbols, okay? The chemical symbol that represents each of these elements, okay? So hydrogen and oxygen are two different elements H and O are the chemical symbols that represent those elements, hydrogen and oxygen, respectively. 
Okay, now if I'm thinking about this in terms of the real world, physical H2O, I want to think in terms of atoms. The individual components that make up water are the hydrogen and oxygen atom. Okay, and I like to think of atoms as being uh, little spheres, right? Like, uh, let me get just me on here. I've actually got what I do with my kit. <laughs> I've got a kit somewhere. <coughs> nice. Oh. All right. I really do think about atoms like these little things here, okay? This center blue one is the oxygen, and you'll see it depicted as blue a lot of times in the text and in different problems. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then the white ones here are the hydrogens, okay? So this is, in the three-dimensional world, this is how I think about atoms. And if you say H2O to me, more than likely I'm going to think about it in terms of atoms like a molecule so let's talk about those words right now atoms versus molecules okay remember that I said these are chemical symbols for the elements so these are just letters they don't really they're something that you write down don't think about it too much in a three-dimensional space in a three-dimensional space you want to look at it like this little molecule here and this will be I put a little H there and a little O there and an H here. Okay, so these are the atoms. This here is the hydrogen atom. This is the oxygen atom. And this whole thing is the, um, I need to adjust my, hold on, I can adjust this real quick. Okay, and this whole thing is a water molecule, okay? So the atom, I can't, I ain't got no space. Molecule. Uh, so the individual components are the atoms. They combine to make a larger component called a molecule. Now if I had a glass of water, I could also call that a compound, right? Um, so more collectively, all of it together, it could be molecules or it could be a compound. Uh, once I get multiple molecules of different atoms, it could be a mixture, okay? So all of these are things you've heard before, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page as far as the terminology and how we use it. So when you think about an atom, you need to think about these little individual uh, little golf balls or whatever. Uh, when I talk about chemical symbols and writing out the letters or the abbreviations for the elements, uh, then you're talking about this right here, right? just the the letters and then the numbers that let you know how many atoms are there right in a three-dimensional world we write out those atoms and you can just count them so that's another way I could do that I could say there's two H's and an O H2O and I can write it out alright uh, let's go back to the text kinda get moving so here's a list of some chemical symbols and the elements most sometimes they're listed uh, kind of barium BA calcium CA cobalt CO uh, they're kind of the first two letters of the name other times they're not those so you, so you can't depend on that um, <coughs> mercury for example is HG that's the uh, what the Latin word for mercury and probably what they were calling it when they actually named it uh, mercury or when they actually named the chemical symbol so that's why some of these are not uh, straightforward just like uh, what you call it gold is not geo for example it's AU <coughs> okay 
uh, these elements are arranged in something called the periodic table. Most of you probably have seen this, but just some inter interesting uh, stuff about it. I think I'm going to put, I'm going to, I can't speak right now. I think I'm going to post a video on Dimitri Mendeleev and kind of how he discovered the periodic table. It kind of lets you know uh, about why it's structured the way it is. So the periodic table is structured the way it is because it was predictable. Mendeleev, Dimitri Mendeleev knew that you could only add one proton at a time. And so he could only have, you know, a certain number would correspond to each atom and uh, adding one proton or taking one proton off it would change that element all right uh, more specific than that obviously he was a genius but uh, just to kind of simplify it he predicted this long before we ever discovered any of these elements and in fact said you know on his little card question mark I think there's something here but I haven't found it yet I'm almost positive there there should be something here and then later on we come to find out yes there was something there um, so brilliant man and the periodic table is so smart and so structured in a way that makes perfect sense so as far as we know we have discovered or predicted every element on the in the universe okay as far as we know um, so that's really amazing right to be able to simplify the whole universe into a little grid like this and be able to break down everything that you can touch taste smell into individual components that's what we're doing with chemistry okay and that's why it's useful and that's why it just it makes so much sense to someone like me um, because it always has that order to it right it's kind of like math in a way right two plus two is always four you can't bend it and make it whatever you want it to be all right so anyway talking about the periodic table they are arranged in groups and periods uh actually for this the powerpoints are probably a little better i'm gonna go to present mode so Pop, 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 pop. Go through here and do your little study checks. Um, oh, this illustration, uh, I'm going to change topics just real quickly here. So these are all carbon atoms. The same thing I was doing on my iPad here. Uh, this is a representation of the carbon atoms in diamonds and in pencil lead, graphite. Um, so notice how different those materials are right diamond is one of the hardest substances on the planet uh, graphite is so soft that it basically breaks all the time while you're writing on your paper it just breaks away onto your paper and leaves a little trail of carbon on your paper all right so one is extremely soft one is extremely hard and the only difference is they're both all carbon atoms the only difference is the way that they're connected so not just knowing what atoms are in something or what elements are in something is not enough information we have to know how they're connected and how they fit together uh, in order to be able to predict what they're going to be like or how they're going to act so there, there's some chemistry links to help these are also in your text I like reading these because it can kind of um, give you some real world perspective on chemistry and why it's important to know it and maybe uh, is make something click like when we talk about mercury you'll say oh I know what that is this is has to do with this health condition right or um, what was the last example they had oh, it was also mercury but the text has some others um, I've always looked into the medicine and the like the anatomy portions of chemistry uh, is the most interesting to me and then it also helped to help things to stick like mercury for example uh, I learned about the vaccines this is way before all of this happened uh, but just learning about vaccines and why there was this stigma about autism and uh, children getting vaccinated and coming up with autism well early on in our vaccination efforts we thought 
that mercury was safe. Older people, like uh, my parents' generation, for example, they used to play with mercury in their hands. And uh, nobody thought this was a bad thing. You know, you, the stuff that's in thermometers, right, that silver, dangerous liquid that nobody ever touches anymore, everybody back in the day used to just play with this stuff in their hands. They didn't know it was dangerous. Well, another thing they used it for was put in vaccines to make a preservative. Uh, bacteria couldn't live in the vaccine if there was some mercury in there. So we would put mercury in with the vaccines to help to uh, preserve it for later. Bacteria wouldn't get in there and uh, it would stay fresh longer. Well, come to find out, putting mercury in your body is not a good idea. And we learned that the hard way. So uh, people get over ambitious all the time. I like to look at those uh, kind of health backgrounds. It just um, helps me understand the chemistry behind it. In fact, mercury itself is not that dangerous. It's when it becomes oxidized, something uh, we'll talk about later in class. But uh, it has to change its form. Just like graphite and diamond are two completely different things, mercury has to change its form from that physical silvery mercury form to something else before it actually becomes dangerous. Now, if it gets in your body, it's going to do that naturally. Your body's going to do that for it. It's going to convert it into different things as it tries to get rid of it. In fact, hurting yourself. So, uh, like I said, chemistry, it, I love it. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm such a geek. But it is really interesting. So go through and read some of those uh, health topics on chemistry. Uh, I think it can be useful maybe spark some interest or whatever so here goes what I was talking about Dimitri Mendeleev uh, I'll probably post a video talking about his uh, work just because it's also very interesting but he broke them down and so there are groups and periods the groups run in vertical lines let me make sure y'all can still see what I'm seeing okay uh, the groups run in vertical lines and we call those individual things like group one is all alkali metals Group two is all alkali earth metals, so on and so forth. Um, there's kind of a weird way of reading this. So one, two, three, you skip all of those transition metals down here on in the middle. Let me see. Um, I got my little thing. Okay, yeah, you skip all of these, and actually group three technically starts right here with boron. Group four, carbon. Group five. Uh, nitrogen group six oxygen and another way of reading it is 1a 2a 3a 4a then when you get finished with the group with the a groups you come down here and start 3b 4b 5b 6b so on okay so remember when you go in group one group two skip all the way to boron before you do group three okay and we'll talk about why that is here in a minute when we break down the atom all right, periods, periods go uh, horizontally and run top to bottom. And outside of electron energy levels, they probably don't tell you very much. So the more important thing to realize is that everything in a certain group has a very similar characteristic or property. All right, um, property is another word of saying characteristic. So uh, I am... Uh, a golfer, I think of myself as a nice person, um, active, uh, caring, whatever. So those are all my characteristics. Uh, people in my family share those same characteristics. Okay, so we're all part of the same group. All right, so that's kind of how I think of it. Um, okay, let's keep going. Where am I at? Okay, and kind of reiterates what I was saying about uh, how to how to count. Why is this not working? Let me go to present mode. Oh my gosh! Present from. Okay. So here's uh, the names of the groups, more clearly defined, right? The halogens, noble gases, no common names, although I do see this called metalloids a lot. There, it's like a, but it doesn't go straight up and down the group. It goes kind of cross-angled, 
All right, so you you might see something with metals, transition elements, or metals. Another way of saying metals. So everything on the left side of the periodic table, all the way over to at least group 3A, is a metal. And then once you get here, they start becoming metalloids. So kind of in between a metal and a gas. And then uh, the gases are on the far right. Okay, so they kind of follow that pattern. Remember, they have the same characteristics. Everything in group 8 is a gas, is a noble gas. Everything in group 7 might not necessarily be a gas, but they all, they all are very similar. Okay? Um, so that's the groups tell you more than the periods do as far as the characteristics of the elements. Okay, and so then this goes through each individual group, and you can do your study checks or whatnot. Uh, okay, here I'll, here's what I was talking about, metals, non-metals, and metalloids. So they say the gases section is non-metals. That's fine, too. Um, metals are located on the left side of the periodic table. Non-metals on the right side of the periodic table, separated by this little diagonal uh coalition of metalloids okay so these have properties slightly in between the metals and the non-metals and you might even see different characters like um, people define the metalloids differently so I probably won't question you that much on those maybe something more general but not specific on which ones are metalloids specifically okay uh, so here goes some of those characteristics, or we like to say chemical properties, that um, metals or non-metals might have. Uh, the halogens tend to have a lot of the similar type properties. But I'll let y'all kind of read through all that. Um, nothing really jumps out as being specifically important about that. Everyone has its own kind of properties. Um, and once you get the hang of this, you'll just be able to look at a periodic table and say, oh, that's a metal. That's on over here. That's a non-metal. You might not even have to look at the periodic table once you know that all the noble gases, if somebody says noble gas, you're just like, oh, yeah, that's a noble gas. Group 8, far right, non-metal. You'll be able to classify this element in all different sorts of ways, right? If I said, what is argon? You could say, well, it's a group 8A metal, a group 8A non-metal. You could say it's a noble gas. You could say um, it has uh, eight valence electrons, which we'll get to here in a minute when we talk about uh, the structure of the atom. Uh, more periodic table stuff. Um, chemistry linked to health, another, like I said, kind of interesting read there. If you want to go to your text and check those out. Um, all right, now the atom. The atom, remember when we were doing, let me get out of here and go back to my pad real quick. Remember, these are what we were drawing as the atoms, okay? So the individual components that build up these molecules and eventually everything that you see around you is built up out of these atoms. All right, so the atom has a particular structure and we went through a lot of experimentation and um, several brilliant people that it took to kind of figure out what's the atom. What is the atom? What's it look like? Um, what's in it? You know, stuff like that. So I'm not, I don't think I'll necessarily be asking you to like, go through these experiments and explain what they uh, did like I don't even remember using it once I got out of the first stages of chemistry so I'm not real sure but we'll, we'll briefly mention it and it's good for you to kind of read through this there'll probably be a couple questions on mastering chemistry you can just kind of use this as a reference right so Dalton, John Dalton, Atomic Theory, proposing that atoms were responsible for combinations of elements and compounds. Um, then they discovered the subatomic particles, which meant that um, atoms were not itself 
you know the smallest kind of breakdown you could do you could actually look inside the atom and say there are protons neutrons and electrons they might not have known what each one of those were at the time but they knew that there were different forces or different molecules I shouldn't say molecules different particles subatomic particles that were at play within the atom even and that's what might lead to different structural connections right something different inside of those carbon atoms or different ways that they were arranged the subatomic particles were arranged allowed them to make diamond or maybe went the other way and made the pencil lead graphite right so they knew there had to be something else uh, and so then we started doing these uh, the cathode ray experiment proved that they were charged that they had these positive and negative charges on it and so when he shot it through a uh, magnetic field or whatever like two magnets on each side uh, it would pull towards one side so that's when he knew that there were electrons they were negatively charged um, let me stop right there and go to the iPad to kind of illustrate something about this all right so you've always heard that uh, saying opposites attract right and when we think about magnets you think about it in terms of poles so uh, let's just say this is my magnet I have a positive and a negative pole okay my next magnet is right here and the positive end is right here the negative end right is right here these two here will be attracted to each other okay and then this will attract to this side right and then by the time everything is bumped around and moves around together uh, I'll have my two magnets will be stood up right beside each other plus minus plus minus and those charges will the opposite charges will attract to each other okay so that is kind of what's at play here in the atom okay except for in the atom we have three different particles all right the first is the neutron okay the neutron the electron and the electron I'm just gonna put a little minus there um, it's very small much smaller than the proton and the neutron so I'm going to write another big one here for proton okay so three different subatomic particles that you need to be concerned with right now alright the proton the neutron and the electron now in the atom all of your protons and neutrons are in the nucleus okay so for those of you who know anything about biology or anything like that you've heard the word nucleus before it's just the center okay so all of my protons and neutrons are in here okay then the electrons let me erase this they revolve around the outer shell okay around the outer edge away from the nucleus even they got their own little space that they reside in around the edge and so what we do for them is we draw their own little orbit we call this an orbit electron orbit specifically and I'll put a little electron there I'll put a little electron there and then guess what it might be even further out on another orbit so electrons have all these little orbits that stack up around the central nucleus okay now this is going to be the one that's really trippy here okay so this is an atom right uh, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, hold on. That's one there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So this is one atom. One atom right here, and that we're looking at. Which atom is it? Let me go to periodic table one two three four five six seven eight nine ten 
One, two. Notice how I counted those electrons on uh, the atom? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is a neon atom. Okay? So, the atomic number, the number that's above the uh, chemical symbol or the element, uh, that is actually listing the number of protons. Okay, so let me go back to my thing. Just so we're clear, uh, this model that I just drew here of an atom is a neon atom. So the same thing that we did here, uh, where was that? With the hydrogen and oxygen, if I were going to draw, an uh, let me draw, I guess I can draw the hydrogen atom first. The hydrogen atom, it would be a nucleus here and then an electron here okay and in the nucleus I got one proton and one neutron okay so like I said it's I think about it in terms of a sphere but if you want to get more specific it's a sphere it's almost like its own little solar system right with the Sun being the nucleus and then planets going around the orbits uh, those planets are the electrons and the Sun is the nucleus okay so if you want to get more like specific in the breakdown of an atom uh, it's actually got a bunch of different orbits around it with these electrons alright so uh, now we know what an atom looks like up close and personal it's got these subatomic particles the proton the neutron the electron uh, let's talk about the charge of each of these Okay, so the electrons have a negative one charge. The proton has a positive one charge. And the neutron doesn't have any charge at all. So that's just zero. We'll call it even. No charge. Um, so when you're thinking about the periodic table, let me come back to the periodic table. Each atomic number is just the number of protons that it has. Okay? So hydrogen has one proton. Helium has two protons. Uh, lithium has three protons, so on and so forth. Now, whether or not that's balanced, for and for all of these elements on the periodic table, it is always balanced. Okay, and that's why I said ten electrons must mean neon, because it also has ten protons. Why do they? Why do they have to have the same amount? Amount because it has to be balanced. And by balanced, I mean has the same number of charges. So let's go back to here. Each one of these is a negative one charge. That's a negative there. Make sure y'all can still see it. Negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, oh, one, negative one, negative one. Okay, so that is a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We we'll miss one, yep, ten. 10 total negative charges. In order for me to balance that out, I have to have 10. Oh, excuse me, hold on. 10 positive charges in the middle to balance that out. And if I have 10 positive charges, that means I have 10 protons. So 10 protons tells me the atomic number is 10 and the element is neon. All right. So, uh, interestingly enough, that's how the periodic table was built. That's why there's only two elements up top, right? Because I can only fit, if I come back to this, come on, two electrons on the first orbit here. Okay, that's how come I have to stop at two on that first period of the periodic table is because that first energy level, the new word we're going to learn, energy level. The energy level is essentially which orbit that the electron is sitting on. Okay, so this inside one right here that would be the first energy level and the one it counts as you go outside that's one that's two this would be three so on and so forth going out 
away from the nucleus. All right, let me come back to the text and make sure they don't mention anything else before we get into all that. Talked about metals, non-metals. That's fine. The atom has an electrical charge, and it was found through various experiments. Um, we represent the mass of an atom with something called the atomic mass unit and it's very small so it has a scientific notation like 10 to the negative uh, 24 or something like that oh no that's the proton mass so we know the pro the mass of the electron the proton and the neutron uh, the proton and the neutron essentially just weigh one amu the electron is very small so tiny in fact that we don't even count it when we do calculations for atomic mass okay <coughs> so general generally if I uh, let me look at this as just like a general principle you can think of the atomic mass of uh, being the pro the number of protons plus the number of neutrons so let me write another page here uh, atomic mass equals protons plus neutrons uh, gosh I don't even know how to spell neutron neutron okay uh, so you've got a couple skills here that you can use and I imagine master chemistry is going to test you on uh, number one the atomic number let me pull up a periodic table let me actually do one on the internet S periodic table something better than that <coughs> okay let me make sure y'all can see this oh this ain't got what I need on it though hold on one more one more try need one that has the atomic mass on it and the okay here we go <coughs> oh my gosh stop it all right so the top number is the atomic number oh this has got them labeled perfect all right, so the chemical symbol is the letter. The atomic number is the number of protons. All right, the atomic weight is also a name for the atomic mass. So this is the atomic mass. Um, this one actually has the electron shell configuration, which you'll understand what that means here in just a minute. Uh, let me talk about atomic mass first. Come back to that. So notice here that hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1, but it also has an atomic number of one so if I look back at my equation here that means that um, hydrogen only has one proton and zero neutrons because its mass is one okay so let's look at another one uh, kinda give you an example helium has an atomic mass of four but an atomic number of two okay Helium, atomic number two, but a mass of 4.008 or something like that. So if I want to know how many protons and neutrons are in there, first I determine how many protons. Uh, that's easy. It's the atomic number, so two protons. Write that down. Protons, my pen's sticking. Uh, and then subtract from subtract that from the atomic mass. 
and you can just round it. So two neutrons. Remember this extra little bit uh, comes from a couple of different areas. We may talk about that later and when we talk about isotopes. Okay, so by having the atomic number and the atomic mass, I can calculate the number of protons and neutrons. If my element is neutral, the number of protons is also the number of electrons. Okay, so that ought to get you through parts of Master and Chemistry for sure. Um, use a periodic table, download you one or I think there's some in your book and there's also one maybe in your lab manual so you ought to have some uh, periodic tables I think Master in Chemistry actually has one if you click up in the top right corner somewhere you'll have a periodic table as well so let me come back to PowerPoints um, so this is where we're at we're talking about the mass of an atom um, that's fine so you have a little study check here has mass but no charge uh, found outside the nucleus right so you go through and test yourself um, this all reiterates what I've been saying so don't like the way I'm saying it, you can come through and read these PowerPoints and it kind of illustrates the same thing. Now where is my isotope section? This is that uh, math equation so you can determine how many neutrons are in there as well if you know the periodic uh, the atomic number or have a periodic table handy bunch of study questions okay here's isotopes so there are occasions where um, elements the same element can have different versions of itself so an element by definition has the same number of protons so all of magnesium's will have 12 protons now what will differ is the number of neutrons that it has okay so it is possible for one magnesium to have 13 neutrons another magnesium to have 11 neutrons uh, and then one might have 12 neutrons and it had the same number 12 neutrons 12 protons uh, we have to account for that when we do atomic mass uh, and so that's where that little variation comes from on the atomic mass, right? Like some of them might say 45.632, right? There's obviously not a sixth of a neutron in there. What we're doing is we're taking one version of the element that has 46 and another element, another version of that element might have 42 atomic mass. And so then the average of those two would come out to 45.6 or something like that. You see what I mean? So isotopes are important in that regard. Um, let's see if they had, and this would be the only math that you would have to do in this chapter, I believe. Um, the, the only tough math, right? Like we had to find the number of neutrons, but this, uh, the isotope problem can get a little bit worse. So let's do a study check. There are three naturally occurring isotopes of carbon, C12, C13, C14. Now when we write it like this, we're given the atomic mass. Okay, so all carbon has six protons, so we can't use the atomic number anymore to differentiate between the different carbons. We have to use the atomic mass because those are the things that are different. So we say C12, C13, C14. These are a carbon that has a mass, atomic mass of 12, a carbon that has an atomic mass of 13, and a carbon that has the atomic mass of 14. Okay? Um, and so you go through and determine how many neutrons, right? Each one has a different number of neutrons, and you could go through and determine how many of those there are. 
Now, uh, it also, study check, you write your own version. Remember the atomic mass goes on top, the atomic number on bottom. Make sure y'all still see Oh, Okay. Now, where are the math? Here's the atomic mass portion that I wanted to get to. Okay. Now this is what you'll be looking for. It's a table or something that tells you what percentage of that element is found in nature. Right? So we talked about magnesium. There are three versions of magnesium out there. There's MG24, MG25, MG26. Okay? Now if you want to figure out what the actual atomic mass of this is, you're going to need to know what percentage of MG12 or excuse me MG24 is in the universe right 78.70 what percentage of magnesium 25 is out there 10 percent and what percentage of magnesium 26 is out there 11 percent okay so now the way to calculate that let me pull up my iPad and I might have to get a calculator to clear this out all right, so we said MG. Oh, I can't read it no more. Just a second. I'll write it back on here. MG24. MG25. MG. Uh, nope. MG26. Uh, make sure y'all can still see me. Okay. Now, below it, I'm going to write the percentages because that's really all I need to know. 70. Below this one is 10.13. And then below this one is 11.17. Okay. So now all of these added together will make one, right? Because they're a percentage. So what I want to do is I want to factor in how much of that percentage is this element okay oh I can't see if y'all see me right? yeah okay so the way I'll do that is I will multiply this times that this times that and this times that now remember these are percentages so let me put a percentage on there um, and then add all of them together okay so for this one, I'm going to say 24, right? 24 is the atomic mass, so that's where I got that number from, MG24. That is the atomic mass. Uh, times, and then when you write a percentage in terms of a decimal, remember to move your decimal two places to the left, okay? So 0 0.7810, no, 787. No, stop, stop. 787. Seven. Then that is going to be added with 25 times 0 0.1013. 1013. And then plus MG, what, the 26 atomic mass times that percentage, which was. 0 0.1117 all right so notice how I just moved the decimal two places for each of these percentages all right so now I can multiply you gotta do each one first right so we'll say this equals and I'm gonna do it on my calculator here sometimes I'll pull a calculator up on the screen and do it there actually let's do that because I want y'all to see the order of operations so calculator uh, make sure you can see okay let me see this one's better I think it pops up full screen yeah okay so first up we're gonna do 24 times uh, 0 0.787 and then that equals 18.88. Notice I got it right here. I'm going to leave that there and I'm going to do the next one because the order of operations is important. 25 times 
zero point up oh, zero point one zero one three enter there and then 26 times 0 0.1117 okay you gotta remember to do your multiplications anything inside those parentheses first and then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna add all three of those numbers up on the side so 18.888 plus 2.5325 plus 2.9042 equals oh it didn't do that last one um, I should have came back here plus 2.9042 equals 24.3247 so let me write that down right here um, uh what we say 18.88 um that was 2.53 and 2.90 all of those add together to equal 24 point three two four seven all right so 24.3247 is the actual calculated mass of magnesium so just so you understand what I'm saying if I go to the periodic table uh, click on this didn't I already have one out click on that click on this click on that magnesium right here 24. Point three zero five I can't really read it right there but uh, twenty four point three zero five so that's how you calculate uh, the atomic mass that's why the atomic mass is not a whole number right it's got these different isotopes or variations of the element okay so now if you do any math this is the kind of math you'll have to be doing um, it's really not that complicated if you get everything in the right place so come back here when you get there and make sure that you're doing each individual component times that percentage of the variation and then add them together separately do uh, mass times percentage plus parentheses mass times percentage close parentheses plus parentheses and you gotta be careful when you put it in your calculator because the, the calculator will mess it up sometimes it doesn't always recognize those print parentheses as separating um, certain parts right it should uh, smarter better calculators uh, should work that way um, but there's a lot of human error that can go into that as well I may come back to that when we get to some other sections talking about uh, more intense math stuff like that all right back to the powerpoints uh, calculating atomic mass so here's uh, an example and some practice that you can do uh, kind of test yourself and see if you're doing it the right way all right and then finally the electron energy levels all right um, I wouldn't worry about this picture here as much um, although I will mention electromagnetic radiation so everything gives off electromagnetic radiation um, or essentially everything is uh, in a way electromagnetic radiation right the Sun beaming down when you see a color that is uh, the light reflecting off of a surface of something and creating some type of energy and when it bounces back into your eyes you see it as a certain color so this is these are kind of highly technical things um, but it is important to remember that just uh, radiation electromagnetic radiation is everything it's, a, it's the Sun beaming down it's when we see colors that's us using light right light is that radiation being reflected off of things you can't see anything in the dark because there is no radiation there to uh, illuminate things okay so 
it's an important concept. I won't talk about it as much, but it's important for you to kind of know. Um, the spectrum here, uh, radio waves, different things have different levels of energy. And now this is different than the electron energy levels. Um, high energy, uh, like x-rays, ultraviolets, everything on this right side. What? Make sure you are seeing what I'm seeing. Okay. Everything on this right side is very high energy. It has a large frequency. And the frequency is, co is directly proportional or inversely proportional to the wavelength which is how quick it goes up and down so the further the smaller the wavelength the faster it goes up and down the more energy okay uh, but it also means it has a higher frequency uh, the lower frequency so, so something like radio waves they have these long wavelengths that stretch out like this and this is in terms of meters so you're talking miles long wavelengths that take miles to kind of oscillate and do this little number here uh, but they're very low energy right so it's just a concept uh, really fast moving waves have high energy okay uh, slower longer moving what they go further um, but have less energy okay so different types of light uh, right all types of light x-rays form of uh, radio magnetic electromagnetic radiation excuse me and then each element uh, it kind of acts in a certain similar way uh, when an element is excited those in those electrons will jump energy levels and it might create uh, a radiation that will you'll see as a certain type of color. That's all this is referring to. We may see some of this in lab, may not. Um, but just know that each one of those colors corresponds to a changing energy level. Okay, like it's a different amount of energy, and because it's a different amount, it creates a different color. Okay, and so that's how we kind of use these colors to know uh, the energy changes of a certain element different elements may have the same color change right because they move the same amount of energy when they're uh, transferred alright so this is the last kind of point I wanted to make is about electron energy levels and this will also have the most impact on the periodic table and its trends okay so let me come to, let me go back to the periodic table real quick. Click on this. All right, so notice that uh, the periodic table is set up in this way. It goes oh, two on the first period, and then one, two, two on the left side, then one, two, three, four, five, six on the right, then two on the left, six on the right, and then we start coming all the way across. Okay, so these are set up this way because these are the number of electrons that exist within an energy level. Okay, let me bring up my iPad and kind of illustrate this again. All right, remember we said back here on the neon atom that I could only get two electrons on that first energy level. So that's what's going on here when an atom is kind of building up itself right in nature uh, a lot of these atoms kind of start in the sun actually right the sun's a bunch of hydrogen burning and then it combines with other stuff and it'll make a helium and then the helium will make an oxygen or something like that uh, but all of these kind of start in these really nasty stars or something like that <coughs> but anyway it starts building up so when I'm building up, let's imagine this is the nucleus. I'll put an N there for nucleus. Uh, when I start adding things to this, if I add a proton to the middle, it's automatically that charge. Remember we said the magnets kind of oppositely attract to each other? If I have uh, one proton in the middle, it's automatically going to try to pull one electron from 
space somewhere, right? <coughs> That's an electron, by the way. I can't write when I'm coughing. And then remember, I do electron is just a little negative circle, okay? <coughs> so it's going to try to pull this electron in to kind of balance those charges out, right? Well, what happens is it can't, let me do the neutron again. Once it gets two electrons, this first energy level is full, okay? And so now it has to start creating more orbits outside of that. It can't fit more than two on this first energy level. <coughs> so then we go to the second energy level, energy level two. All right, now for it, it has two orbits, right? The first energy level only has one orbit. The next energy level, energy level two, has two orbits. It has the inner orbit, which just like energy level one, could only hold two electrons. <coughs> this next one can hold up to uh, six electrons. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. So now all of this, both of these orbits are energy level two. I'll just say N equals two. And I'm also going to erase the N off of that because we know that's the center of the atom now, right? That's the nucleus. I'll just kind of fill it in. So that's the nucleus. Um, then the, uh, this one here was energy level one. All right. So notice there's a pattern, and there's there's a certain number of electrons that you can fill in in certain places before the orbit has to expand. And as you get further out, you can fit more and more electrons on there, which makes sense, right? Because the orbit is so much bigger the further out away from the nucleus you get. I can fit more and more electrons on there. That's essentially what's happening here on the periodic table. When I started out real tight to the nucleus up top here, I couldn't fit but two electrons around that first uh, orbit. Then I got a little further out away from the nucleus and my ring gets a little bigger I can start plugging in more that's when this next series of uh, electrons can be filled in the boron through the neon and the aluminum uh, through sulfur through chlorine argon then once I get out here to the transition metals I'm at these outer energy levels where I can put 10 or 16 electrons on the outer shell okay so that's in terms of energy level. Let me also type in, just see what comes up. Electron energy level. Um, images. Let's see. So here's a good depiction. It says two on the inner shell, eight on the next energy level, 18 on the third. Now, they didn't quite break it down into... Uh, the individual orbits, they're kind of grouping them all together. Um, but there are like micro orbits, right, in between the larger uh, energy levels. So this is a good depiction, though. I didn't mean to click on that. Uh, let me see if there's something else here. No, I mean, these are, they're all pretty much the same. So just uh, two on the most inner shell, then eight, then 18, then 32. Uh, but there is another thing I want to kind of focus on, which is, where is that image that I wanted? This one. Yeah, this one works pretty good. Okay, so um, as I said, you'll see that as it gets away from the center, these are increasing energy levels, 
right? And uh, we actually have a naming system for the different energy levels. Let me see if I can pull up the text and see what it calls it. I haven't been on the text in a second, so let me catch it back up to where we are on the lecture. And this is almost over. I guess I'm just over an hour now. I didn't plan on it to be this long, but I wanted to make sure I touched on everything as in-depthly as I could. I guess I don't have the term for it. Okay. Uh, anyway, going back to the periodic table, this is the reason that the periodic table is set up this way, obviously, but it also creates these different things, these trends. Okay, the way these electrons line up on the on the uh, atom creates these different trends. So, on your study guide, uh, let me show. You. I keep messing up. Let me go to the book first. So it's 4.7. You'll see the section for trends and periodic properties. All right, and it starts this thing called where we talk about valence electrons. All right, so a valence electron is just the number of electrons on that outer energy level. Okay, the easiest way to calculate that is to go to your periodic table and count the periods down then count the number over. Okay, so what do I mean? Uh, let's say aluminum. Okay, don't even worry about counting the periods. Just count the group number. Usually, most usually, the group number is going to be the same number as the number of valence electrons. So, uh, aluminum's in group three. I have three valence electrons. Um, oxygen is in group six so I have six valence electrons I'm gonna put it on my iPad here and do one um, let's do fluorine fluorine this is my nucleus right here and I'm not gonna do the, and I'm gonna do the energy levels like they did on that last little diagram where I can just do two and eight uh, so then two electrons on the first energy level on the next one I can put up to eight but fluorine if I look at my up oh, at my periodic table oh you're on the fluorine has is in group seven so that's how many valence electrons are going to be on that outer shell the first two that I put in those two on the inner shell that was this hydrogen and helium electron right that inner uh, energy level now I'm on this next energy level and I can put up to eight on it alright so back to bad uh, fluorine however is in group seven so it only has seven valence electrons valence electrons are just the number of electrons on this outer shell so if it's in group seven it's got seven valence electrons and it's pretty much that easy whatever group it's in that's most most notably going to be the number of valence electrons. This can change if the charge changes because a charge lets you know that there's not a neutral number of protons and neutrons, right? So, but in a neutral atom, uh, the valence electrons is the same as the atomic, as the group number, excuse me. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. This is fluorine. Notice if I count the total number of electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that will match the atomic number, right? Fluorine atomic number 9. So valence electrons, the group number, group 7, 7A, right? And then the atomic number is the number of protons, 9. All right, but it also happens to be the number of electrons because this is a neutral element. All right, for the periodic table trends, those valence electron configurations, uh, that's what we call them, how many valence electrons and the energy level that they're on, uh, will determine these periodic table trends. Now, on your review guide for uh, the midterm, 
I've included a box that has uh, periodic table trends. Let me type it in here. Periodic table trends, images. Uh, yeah, most of them look something like this. All right, so just real briefly, I'm going to tell you what each one of these are. All right, so the atomic radius. Let me start with this one. No, that's not a good one, I guess. Uh, let's see. Atomic radius, electron affinity, electronegativity, ionization energy, ionization energy. Yeah, this one's fine. Okay, so as I go from top to bottom, the radius gets bigger. Why is that? Well, we said it earlier because the more I get away from the thing, the more energy levels I add on, the larger this circle gets. So as I go down the periodic table or the periods get higher, the more energy levels stack on the outside and the radius, the atomic radius is how far it is uh, across here, right? The radius of any circle or whatever. Or actually from the center out. Let me redo that. This is the atomic radius right here. Um, it gets bigger as you go down the periodic table. Now, a tricky part, though, is it gets smaller as you go to the right. Now, you would think I'm adding on electrons, so I should be getting bigger. But actually... I'm adding electrons on to the same energy level. So let me do two different atoms here. You'll see what I mean. All right. And this goes back to that uh, opposites attract thing, right? So this was one, two on the first energy level. Um, one, two on this energy level here. Now remember, this is just the nucleus in the center. All of these orbits are just electrons going around their energy level. All right, and so then on this one, I got one, two, three, four. Let's say on this one, I have two. Okay, so now what happens on the periodic table is the radius gets smaller as you go from left to right. Okay, so say for example, uh, hydrogen is larger in size than helium is and you say well, why is that it the helium has more protons more neutrons and more electrons how is it smaller than the hydrogen well it's because of these pu pushes and pulls of electrons and neutrons okay so coming back to this image right here remember that this center here has a bunch of positive charges so let's say four positive charges in the middle that's a positive there I don't know if you can see that um, and then around the outer shell it has uh, let's say two electrons two negative charges right here on the outer shell okay now come to this one this one has what one two three four five six positives and six negatives or four negatives on the outer shell we'll say four negatives on the outer shell okay so imagine each one of these is like a magnet each one of these protons is like a positively charged mag magnet each one of the net the electrons is a negatively charged magnet magnet excuse me so what ends up happening is these are pulling toward that positive center right here and the more electrons I have, the tighter it pulls in, okay? So when I'm going from left to right on the periodic table, I'm adding electrons to the same shell, right? The same energy level is pulling in tighter each time toward the nucleus, okay? Those increase in charges increases the pull of the magnets, so to speak, toward the center, all right? So that's how you explain the atomic radius and how it goes smaller as you go from left to right. All right. So uh, valence electrons also indicates electron affinity. Electron affinity, affinity for anything is just how much you want something, how much you need to have something. Affin my affinity for a person is great. I want her there all the time. All right. Um, 
electron affinity can kind of tell you how many valence electrons are. So one of the purposes of all elements is to get to a stable configuration. We call it stable configuration. That either means zero valence electrons or filled up valence electrons. You either want to have all or none in terms of valence electrons. So what happens with, let's say, two different atoms, let's say this one only has one electron, and this one has two electrons, and this is just that first energy level. So that first energy level can only hold two, remember? Um, so essentially this one is filled. It is content. It doesn't have any affinity for any other electrons, right? It's happy with who it's with now. And so that means the electron affinity, I'll call it EA, is low, okay, because it's completely filled. Now this one, on the other hand, it's in a weird spot, right? It could give away one electron and be happy on its own, just being like this, or it could accept one electron, end up like this, and be just as happy as this guy here right uh, so really it has good electron affinity it will take it if it needs to but it also has some ionization energy and that's what this other one is let me see if it's on oh, didn't mean to do that again is it on this one yeah ionization energy you can't see the top of that one let me click on this one ionization energy is how willing it is to get rid of an electron okay or how excuse me, I should say how much energy it would take to remove or add on an electron okay so uh, electron affinity let me go back to the iPad um, the electron affinity for this one is uh, relatively low but still there and then the ionization energy for this one is um, pretty low because it doesn't take a lot of energy to get that away. It would be happy by itself. All right. So I'll include another video on the periodic table trends. Um, you really need to see a lot of these illustrations, I would think. Uh, I mean, you can just look at the table and say, where on the periodic table are they talking about? and then follow your lines right the ionization energy goes up as you go from left to right it goes up as you go from bottom to top uh, electron affinity oh, let me pull the table back up it'll just be easier right so this is keep clicking on it um, this is also what I included on the midterm review alright so the valence electrons have every indication of these periodic table trends okay so just to review the atomic radius is from the center to the outer edge of the atom electron affinity is how much it wants to have another electron from the surrounding area how much it wants to take up an electron and then the ionization energy is how much energy I'd have to put into it to get rid of an electron okay or to add an electron all right if it's content if it's got a full shell uh, it's going to take a lot of energy to pull one off or put one on all right and then one last note just to make sure that we're clear uh, the goal let me pull up the actual periodic table the goal of all elements essentially is to either be in a noble gas configuration with eight valence electrons or in a zero uh, configuration so less than hydrogen hydrogen actually likes to give away its um, electron and just exists as a proton because it wants to have either zero or full right on your electron shell all right uh, anyway I think I'm kind of rattling now uh, we've been at it for a little while double check the PowerPoint to make sure I didn't miss anything trends and periodic table and like I said this goes through all the same stuff uh, I didn't mention metallic character because that's kind of implicit as you get further left it's more metal 
as you get further right on the periodic table it's less metal or more non-metal um, the valence electrons can also be expressed in this thing called the Lewis symbol I hate I didn't mention this uh, but I'll actually I'll probably include a video because there's some good connecting philosophies that I think we need to learn for the future um, so I'll include a video on that as well let me write this down real quick so Lewis dot and we need something on electron energy levels and periodic table trends okay so I think those will be the hardest sections um, I'll put some extra stuff on the content page with all of that uh, like I said this week was supposed to be a little bit less intensive um, so I spent more time kind of talking about each subject I just I wanted it to be as clear as possible uh, email me if you have any questions and I will have Master in Chemistry posted by this evening all of this should be posted the, uh, the quick links to YouTube and different things will be posted as well so uh, good luck and I will see y'all next time